are back with Hannah Cox from Better Not Stop. And this is going to be a really interesting episode because we're going to be talking all about money. And money is a subject that basically a lot of people don't like discussing. There's almost this like secrecy and this fear and this embarrassment. And it's almost like some people are brought up or it's rude to talk about money. But it unfortunately is one of those those central themes and also one of the biggest excuses that people have for not following their dreams and you know not living the life they want to. And I, I've used it as well. You know, I can't afford to, I don't have the money. Hannah, welcome back to the Tough Girl Podcast Extra. Um, Yeah, money. Let's talk about money. Let's talk about you. And let's talk about £20,000 worth of debt. What, what, What was happening? Oh, God. Well, what wasn't happening, if we're honest? Too much was happening, which is why I was £20,000 worth of money in debt. So at university, I'm 34. So I went to uni uh, when I was 19 years old. And I'm not from a rich family at all. If I kind of, if I start from the beginning, I'll just give you a kind of brief overview. I mean, my mum would hate me to say poor, but we we didn't have a lot of money when we were kids. Essentially, I think you know when we turned 15, you had your school shoes bought for you, your school coat bought for you. If you needed anything else, you got a job. So I got a job, and I worked all the time um, from like 15 years old. At one point, I had you know like three jobs at the weekend. I would get up in the morning clean Tesco fish and meat counter then I would go to the pub and I would work kind of the lunchtime shift at the pub and then it would get to three o'clock and I would go to the fish and chip shop and I would work at the fish and chip shop till 9 30 so I would do cut like a six till 9 p.m day which I'm sure which definitely is illegal but that's what I was doing when I was you know 18 years old I worked a lot and then I went to university and kind of got my overdraft got my student loan I was also working a full-time job as well while I was at university. I worked as an assistant manager in a snooker hall. And then I also worked as a waitress in an Italian restaurant. Unfortunately, despite the fact I was making quite good money, I was also spending quite good money. And I definitely had this kind of reward idea in my head that if if you've worked hard, play harder so I enjoyed being generous with my money and treating my friends and I just wasn't very sensible with it by the time that I finished university I just racked up all these credit cards and at the time I don't have any credit cards now but if you hit your limit on your credit card they just increase the limit and then you could just pay the minimum that's how I was living and then I got into a relationship which didn't work out and unfortunately due to several boring long stories about what happened there by the time I finished university the amount of credit card debt overdraft and this loan that I then bought to kind of try and get out of debt which had then disappeared as part of this relationship I was 20,000 pounds worth of debt and it was like what is going on (laughs) how have I managed this yeah I was it was a complete surprise do you have like a wake-up call when you were suddenly like uh, oh my god I need to do something about this I mean were you getting like the statements in the post and just not looking at them were you burying your head in the sand or you like constantly aware but sort of pushing it to the back of your mind when I was at uni I had a job I also ran a club night that gave me quite a good income and I'd got out this kind of personal loan to expand that kind of events business that I was doing Anyway, my relationship broke down and I ended up uh, just leaving everything behind. And I went to Nottingham to go work, work in a bar there because I just couldn't be in the, in the, in, I was, it was a very small town. I went to uni and it it would have been quite difficult to stay there. So I moved and it's kind of when I moved that that's when I was, became aware of the situation I was in. I wasn't earning as much money as I had done before. So suddenly the minimum payments on my credit cards became really tough to keep up with. Um, And I didn't have the income that I'd had before. So my my income had drastically reduced. I just couldn't afford to pay my minimum payments anymore. And I think when you get to that point, that's the point where you're thinking, well, if I can't afford to pay the minimum payments, I'm never going to be able to afford to pay this off. And I think that's the point where I felt completely overwhelmed by my money situation 
that was the beginning of a 10 year kind of debt free journey for me. But like you said, I sat down and did the maths of it the other day, kind of on the back of a napkin. And I was only overspending by a couple of hundred pounds a month over the course of five years when I was living in um, living in the north. So it's not a huge amount of money. And I wasn't like crazy, crazy, but it was, you know, that extra dinner out with a friend or that extra night out or that extra shop in New Look and I'd suddenly spent a hundred pounds on clothes. It was like small, these small kind of incremental things that had got me into this huge amount of debt. And then it, and then I got to the point where even paying off the minimum of it was incredibly hard to do. It's basically almost like the equivalent of like compound interest. If you are spending spending less than less than you earn, then you can obviously save that and it'll grow quite quickly. But equally, yeah. even just spending over by just you know even just a few hundred pounds, you don't think it's much, but actually it will add up and it will will compound. So you're at this point now, and you're you're struggling to pay off off your debts. What did you do? Oh my god! So I actually. <laughs> I did like the worst thing. This is not any advice I'm giving anybody of what I next did because I had to leave Nottingham. I was, I was, wasn't in a, I didn't have a support network in Nottingham and I was in a very bad place because I had just set up with a long-term partner and I was having these money issues. So I moved back home. My mum picked me up and took me back home. Um, so I was just working in a pub back home, living with my mum, realising that I was going to have to get, you know, a proper job. And we live about 45 minute train ride from London. So in my head, I was like, right, I'm going to move to London. I'm going to start working in events again. And I got offered a job in London working for a music marketing company. And I thought, great. So I started looking on Gumtree for cheap places to live so I could move down and get a job down there. And I saw this advert on Gumtree that said, would you like to live on a tropical island? I just thought, Yes, I would. Do you know what? I would love to live on a tropical island and I would love to not have to deal with all this reality, essentially, that I'm having to deal with in the UK. So I replied to this Gumtree advert and I met this guy in Peterborough train station for like a Costa or something. And I spoke to him for like half an hour. And then, yeah, the next week I was on a plane to Singapore. So I actually ended up disappearing for a year and living on a tropical island. Um, luckily, I was able to keep up my minimum payments. At this point, I started to put together um, an IVA for my um, for my debts. And I was able to keep up those minimum payments. My, my dad supported me with that. And then I was owing him the money. But there was no way that I was ever going to be able to pay back that debt if I kind of continued this ridiculous idea of living on a tropical island. So then I did actually come back to the UK and decide to kind of deal with it head on but yeah I would love to say that I kind of got my stuff together and was like right I'm gonna I'm gonna sort this out now but that that wasn't how it went I did I did disappear to Asia for a year Uh, but I also need to be completely transparent and realistic I think when it comes to money about what I did because it wasn't good decisions got me there in the first place so I wasn't immediately going to be someone that made good decisions and even now there are some decisions I make that aren't great, but I also think as long as you're honest about them, I think if you didn't learn from them, which you should have, and I definitely have, hopefully someone else will as well. Okay, so quick segue, Tropical Island, <laughs> give us the brief lowdown, because to be honest, that sounds really dodgy. <laughs> I know, I com- I completely agree with you. It was, it, it was insane. So basically, it was a Gumtree advert that said, would you like to live on a tropical island? And I thought, yeah, I would like to live on a tropical island. And I mean, this was kind of pre, pre face, you know, I think it was like early Facebook. I think, you know, everyone had a MySpace, but you know, how, how the internet was being used then was completely different. And I know that makes me sound super old, but yeah, Gumtree was kind of this weird place where loads of stuff was happening. And I met this guy and he, he basically, yeah, said, we have this resort on Tiamen Island, which is this, it was in the, the film South Pacific. It's this beautiful island on the east east coast of Malaysia. We're looking for some English staff to work at it. I'd done some scuba diving. Really weird. I'm in a town of about 15,000 people. But for some reason, we had a scuba diving school in Royston. And despite the fact I couldn't drive, I had learned to scuba dive. And he said, you know, we're looking for someone who can scuba dive and work in the bar. And I was like, perfect. I work in a bar. 
I can scuba dive. I'm your girl. And he said, well, we're going to get this other girl to do it as well. We ended up, she came to my hometown and we kind of went for drinks and we thought, yeah, well, we get on. So this will be fine. She's like, this is a bit weird. And yeah, it is a bit weird, but should we just go for it? Yeah, fine. So yeah. So then we basically, we had to pay for our flights over there. And then we kind of got paid like a monthly stipends and our food was uh, free and the accommodation was free. And then we just kind of worked on this really tiny resort bizarre that we had this like incredibly crazy experience together looking back now I can't believe my mum even let me go but I think my mum just thought she's going to go whether I give her permission or not so I might as well support her while she's away but it was a very strange time we didn't have the internet at the resort so if you wanted to send an email we had to kind of get a boat round to the village and get to the internet cafe and we could only do that if we were picking someone up from the village and if we had time and we weren't working so there'd be the kind of these five six week periods of when I just hadn't heard from anybody because I couldn't get to my my email and it was my birthday while I was out there and I remember we were at a village kind of the village over from the resort and we were helping me and the guy called Simon who was diving with me we were helping a cleaner boat and we went into the shop to pay for to get some drinks. And there was a box in this shop that just said like Hannah Cox. And then this was about three months, four months after my birthday. And I was like, what's that box? And they were like, oh, we just got delivered this box, but we don't know who it's for. So we just have it in the corner. And I said, well, that's that's my box. And my sister had sent me kind of some, some books and some sweets in the UK. And this box had just been kind of sat in the corner of this shack for like, two or three months before I'd seen it yeah it was it was incredibly crazy and unfortunately it will be hard for anyone to have a similar experience now because I mean I was back in Southeast Asia just last year and there's wi-fi everywhere and you've got a phone and you can get on Facebook and stick stuff on Instagram it was a very kind of different time but yeah it was crazy and that's that's what I did so uh, we've had a nice sort of tropical <laughs> tropical interlude from from the debt. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, the debt is still there. And you mentioned something um, called an IVA. Can you explain what an IVA is? Essentially, you're in a ton of debt. Uh, the first thing I would say to anyone listening to this podcast is go to a website called Money Saving Expert. It's, a, it's run by a guy called Martin Lewis. It's got so much incredible information on there. And plus there's forums on there as well so you can ask other people for support essentially what happened to me was I was unable to pay back uh, the minimum payments on my cards and that was the case before I went away anyway even in when I was working full-time I just didn't have enough money in full-time work and paying kind of my mum a rent to be able to pay back any of these minimum payments and and that was kind of the crux of the problem for me because it didn't matter what I did I just could not afford to pay these payments. I think they were around six, seven hundred pounds a month just in minimum payments and debt repayments. And it was an incredible amount of money. And I was only earning around a thousand pounds a month. So just the maths wasn't working. So I had on the table at the time two things that I could have done. One was declare bankruptcy, which not a lot of people know that that also you have to pay to declare bankruptcy so it actually costs a couple of hundred pounds to declare the fact that you don't have any money or it did at the time and I thought well that's I don't even have a couple of hundred pounds to declare that I've got no money and also if you declare bankruptcy it also massively affects obviously any financial decisions you're going to have for the future like applying for a mortgage any credit in the future if you want to be the director of a company and also for me I and this is again completely personal I felt I've got myself in this situation. I want to take ownership of this debt that I've created and try and find a way to pay back as much of it as I can. So I I had arranged before I went away to pay back these minimum payments and my dad helped me do that. And actually, even though it was quite irresponsible that I went away, the amount of money that I was able to pay back while I was away was definitely more then I would have been able to pay back if I'd been in the UK and having to pay rent and bills and food while working in London. It just, the the maths wouldn't have worked out as well. I was actually able to pay back more while I was away. And then the second option is, so there's bankruptcy and then this other option is IVA, which is, stands for Individual Voluntary Arrangement, which is 
is essentially when like an umbrella debt collection agency, you go to them and you say, look, this is all the money that I owe. And you give them all the information on all the people you owe money to. And you tell them what your income is and your outgoings. And then they work out how much money you can afford to pay back every month. And then they will go to the people that you owe money to and they will work out essentially a deal with all of them about how much money of that pot that's left at the end of the month goes to each individual company. Um, so that's that's what I ended up doing. And within that, there's very kind of strict rules. So you have to show your rent agreement. So you have to be able to prove how much you're paying on rent. You have to prove how much your bills are. So you have to provide this umbrella agency with information on like all the expenses that are coming out every month. And also you're only allocated a certain amount of money you can actually spend on other things. So if we broke it down to something very simple, say you were earning £10 a month and your bills and your rent came to £8 a month. So you had £2 left. Um, according to this umbrella debt company, you'd only be allowed to spend 50 pence a month on your food. So therefore you've got £1.50 left, which will then go to to the people that you owe money to. So it fluctuates. It's an agreement over five years. But if your financial situation changes and you essentially are earning more money over that period, they work out that you should start paying back more money if you start to earn more money. So it's not that, oh, I'm not earning a lot of money and I just have to pay back this much every month. And if I get a really highly paid job in a year, I'm still only going to have to pay back this much a month. It's entirely dependent on your circumstances at the time so they do like six monthly reviews where you have to provide your bank statement show them what you're spending your money on and they will review and your what your monthly repayments can go up or down within that five-year period did it take you five years to clear the debt or how long were you paying it off for uh, it took longer than that for me. If you are really struggling with money um, during any of those points, you can ring up, or certainly with the agency I w- was with, you can ring up and essentially kind of take like a couple of months holiday from paying back your debts. If you've had something happen to you, um, for example, I had major surgery during my 20s where I had to take six weeks off work so and I'm self-employed so I just wasn't earning any money during that period I also had um, my father die during I don't know why I said father I always called him my dad my dad died uh, during that period as well so again I struggled with earning enough money during that period so they were flexible but certainly there was you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to get anything past them and also I didn't want to but yeah, having an IVA is a way in which by the end of it, you've paid back as much as you, it feels, it felt for me good because I knew that once that was paid back and for me, I think it took actually about six and a half years, maybe seven, maybe, but yeah, maybe a bit longer. I did know, however, that I had paid back as much as I physically could pay back during that period, which for me was important. And it was frustrating because there was no other way to work that out because ultimately if you you are in a situation with your debts where you can't afford to pay back your minimum payments these companies will take you to court take you to debt collection agencies and you can kind of be in a lot worse position than you are so at the time for me that was that was the road I needed to go down I ended up paying about two-thirds of the money that I owed back rather than the whole the whole amount but yeah, it's yeah, twenty thousand pounds was paid off through my twenties, and an IVA is a decision that isn't to be made lightly because it does affect your credit rating. But certainly for me, it was the best option because it took away the stress of dealing with lots of different people that I owed money to. I had one agency that I spoke to; the staff were always really fantastic, very understanding, and there was this understanding that yes, you are trying to pay it back your debts, but yes you have to have a life as well. But I quite liked the fact that if you were earning more money or less money, that they were flexible with their support with you as well. Are you out of debt now? Yes. So completely debt free, um, about just under a year before we went on our expedition. So really crazily, though, I managed to get, you know, this 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 20 grand of debt that had been hanging over my head for like my 20s. And you know, I was constantly having to really budget and kind of work with my money during that period because, like I said, you're constantly getting reviewed of your money coming in and coming out. So 
if I was earning more money, I was having to then pay more money back to my debt collection agency. So it was it was making sure that if I was earning more money, that I was keeping that money in the bank because that would then have to go on my debt. So I kind of had this like all of my twenties, like money was always such like a constant, constant concern of how I'm spending, how much was owed. And then when that eventually went, I think it was 2016 was just, yeah, the feeling of paying it all off was, I can't explain how insanely amazing that feeling was. It was like, I've took responsibility for it. It took me ages, but I paid it back and I will never, ever, ever, ever get in debt again. As much as it was a really harsh lesson to learn, I'm glad I learned that in my 20s because I've even now got friends in their 30s who are in debt, whether it's a mortgage or car repayments or loans or credit cards, and I am completely debt free. I don't have a credit card. I don't even have an overdraft on my bank account. And then, as you know, I went on a 10-month expedition, which wasn't free. I then managed to raise £15,000 in a year, which was entirely self-funded, to then go away on this trip. So if anything, it kind of flipped, flipped the switch for me. And I was like, right, I've just, I could do anything now. And I did. You've talked about being like a minimalist adventure. When did you, did you become a minimalist because of this? And did you start selling off your off your excess items on eBay in order to raise more more funds and money? Certainly minimalism for me, if if um, anyone listening doesn't know much about it, I certainly recommend a website called The Minimalists, which are two guys, Ryan and Josh from America, who've written some in- really incredible uh, essays and um, information on kind of the, I guess, the movement you would call it. Uh, minimal- minimalism is this idea that people are important and things aren't important and it's not that we all uh, minimalists kind of live in empty rooms you know with nothing on the wall I mean I sell art as a job so if anything I want you to put stuff on your wall it's the idea that your priorities and kind of your focus are put in your relationships with yourself and with the people around you and not so much on spending money on things so for me it came around the right time because I couldn't afford to spend any money on things. I was on an IVA. So the things that I spent money on were food. And that was kind of pretty much it. So when it came down to my social life, you know, I had to think about ways I could spend time with friends that wasn't going to cost a lot of money. In regards to my travel life, I had to think about ways I could travel that wasn't going to cost me a lot of money. Things about ways I could entertain myself that wasn't going to cost a lot of money. So minimalism kind of just came in at this time. And it was like, Oh, this isn't this isn't just budgeting. This is a thing. It's called minimalism. It's 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 called taking away all the excess stuff that you don't need and focusing on the stuff that you do need. And it just kind of came hand in hand with my with my debt free journey. Even now, you know, if I look at like clothes or shoes and I just think, well, I've got a, I've got a pair of trainers. I don't need another pair of trainers. And actually, for me, things like that represent my freedom because as we all know it takes time to make money so i see every kind of purchase that i make is 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 this going to am i going to use this is this going to enhance my life is it worth the money i'm paying for and i kind of judge everything based on how many hours i would have to work to buy it so for example say i get paid 10 pounds an hour I keep going back to this £10 thing. I don't know why. But um, for a pair of trainers that are 60 quid, I'm like, well, would I work all day just to get a pair of trainers? And I think, well, no, actually, I wouldn't. But I would definitely work all day to be able to afford to go and have dinner with my friends or go away for the weekend or so, have, you know, have some quality time. So, yeah, minimalism is great if you're budgeting. But it's also just great anyway, because it, it, it does change your mindset of kind of what's important and how you should be spending your time, because it does really bring this correlation of kind of our time and money together. Oh, 100%. But it's really tough as well. I mean, I went through a period of, um, of two years when I was building up Tough Girl, where I was having to say no to everything, no coffees with friends, no cinema trips, no going out, no socialising. Because I'd look and think, well, do I want to go out for you know, for a meal with with friends or or go and have drinks or, you know, if I go and buy like a round of drinks, it's suddenly like I'm just going into debt for it. And it's just something I just didn't want to do. And 
unfortunately did lead to some very I suppose like awkward conversations because I remember I got invited to someone was having like a dinner party and I thought brilliant I can just go around I can take a few bottles a few bottles of wine it's not going to cost me anything because you know while well, I live with my parents so I can just take their wine so total win and um and then suddenly it got changed it was like oh no actually we're all going to go out for dinner now on Friday night and I was just like no because that means that I can't come and it was and I was so excited as well about you know going along to having this really nice catch up um, with friends and it just didn't happen because I just had to turn around and you know I didn't really want to say actually I'm really sorry guys I can't actually afford this I had to basically say oh I'm sorry there's been a change of plan so basically I look like really flaky but it is just it's um it's difficult when you're when you're in that situation I mean we've obviously you know we've, we've talked about your debt and we should probably say as well Hannah and myself we are not debt advisors we are not financial advisors this is just personal advice and tips so make sure you speak to a professional um, about your own individual financial situation the second bit I want to talk to you about is um, you know in the previous episode we talked about your incredible adventure the road to happiness where you did go and spend you know um, like twenty. no how many weeks were you away for traveling Ooh, so 10 months so like 40 something weeks yeah so you're on the road for 40 odd weeks 10 months you obviously needed funds to go on this adventure and I think you, you said that you saved 15,000 pounds up in a year let's talk more about how you saved that money because you didn't have and this I hope this doesn't sound rude like a particularly high paid job <laughs> <laughs> yeah how did how did you end up doing it oh god yeah. that wasn't rude was it was that I was rude like, how's she gonna no, I was like, how's she gonna? Yeah, well, this, this is the thing, though, Sarah. Like, it's not rude to talk about it. Like, it's fine. It's fi- I think it's fine to talk about it, and it's it's taken me a while to decide it's fine to talk about it. But this is exactly kind of what the issue is, isn't it? It's people get embarrassed to say they can't afford to do things because because of how society's told us it's embarrassing to say we can't afford to go out. But actually, really, why are we spending, you know, seven pounds on a glass of wine in a bar when, like you said, you know, you can go to Tesco, spend seven pounds on a bottle of wine and have your friend round at your house that you're already paying rent for and just sit in your kitchen or your lounge or your, you know, dining room table and have the same conversation you're going to be having with them in that pub at home. To me, now that my kind of attitude and concept about money has changed, I'm even more determined to be comfortable talking about it and to be able to say you know I can't afford that and you know instead of going to expensive coffee shop and getting an expensive coffee why don't we just grab you know a McDonald's coffee and go for a walk along the canal or I'll bring a flask and we'll go for a walk along the canal it's just changing that and actually people who are your friends don't really care they just want to spend some time with you so it's yeah it's definitely changing that But anyway, to go back to your point, no, never earned loads of money. The most money I've ever, ever been employed at since since leaving um, university is 25 grand a year. So that's kind of where I'm at with kind of my my top earnings. The reason that I managed to save that much money within that year was because I had a goal and I was determined not to fail. Like I said, I had this two bedroom um, house in Manchester one of the reasons I had a two bedroom place was because when I moved up to Manchester, I moved from London where everything's super expensive. I've been sharing a, like a flat with a friend and I think my it was costing me around, I think about £800 a month for my rent and my bills in that flat. And then when I moved up to Manchester because I got offered a, a contract job up here. But yeah, so what I did in that year where I did save £15,000 was I got a flatmate, which reduced my monthly income by half. So that immediately rather than thinking that was money that I had it was immediately money that could kind of go in the pot to be saved and then I was had this freelance work that I was doing which is slightly higher wage than a full-time job and I was saving that I was cycling into work it was a 13 mile cycle into work so I often cycle in rather than get the train which would save me money lots of pat lunches lots of spending time with friends that didn't involve spending any money and it was actually incredibly surprising to me that I managed to save up that amount of money in that amount of time. But yeah, that's how I did it. 
when you are actually working extra jobs, you're probably spending so much time extra working that you actually don't have time to spend your money. And if you can end up being really like ruthless and well, not ruthless, but really focused and like this is what I need to save. And yes, I am going to cycle to and from work every day to save money on transport costs. I'm going to have a packed lunch every day. I'm going to be really sort of economical. It does sort of um, add up, which is amazing. And also doing the Airbnb and if you've got a spare room, use it because there's, so, there's almost it's like this side hustle now like, that, that people can mm-hmm. do. And I don't know if you watch like Gary Vaynerchuk and like doing the flip challenge and you know finding stuff in charity shops and then selling it on eBay. Yeah, I love him. He's so angry. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing. Definitely, yeah. Everybody go and watch Gary Vaynerchuk. You have to watch quite a few of his episodes to almost get through to who the real Gary Vaynerchuk is. But in in terms of yeah motivation and you know side hustle and you know following your passions and, and doing what you love he's that de- he's definitely 100 percent very inspiring you've obviously got your blog and you've got your your other business your sort of tattoo art brand stag and raven where you are selling selling art as well how are you making money from from being an adventurer because this is this is a, i mean i can, i'm happy to talk about like how I, how I make money but um it's always interesting to hear it from other people Essentially, I spent that year saving the money for for our trip away, and now I'm back. Um, we got back in uh, mid to January, late January. We spent two months living with Phil's parents because basically we needed to find somewhere to live, and it, it took that long to find somewhere to live in Manchester. So we only actually got up to Manchester at the end of March. So re- really, from that January to March, there was kind of no opportunity for either of us to be making any money because we were just in this like state of flux and we were really lucky enough to be able to stay with Phil's parents during that time because it was it's lovely to stay with them anyway but it was definitely from a financial point of view it did take that burden off but yeah now we're back in Manchester we've been back for about a month now Phil for work he's fine he's had the same job he travels for work he's a freelance um, technician so his kind of job hasn't changed so his financial situation is kind of the same as it was before mine is completely different now because before when I was here I was working for somebody else several creative agencies and event companies I would work as a freelancer which meant that I got paid a day rate I worked on projects um, for them and then I would kind of finish the project and then go on to the next one unfortunately for me now that's that's not an option uh, for two reasons one is that I do want to make a career as a maybe not full-time adventurer but certainly like that'd be a huge part of my life and and my better not stop blog being a part of that secondly my business partner who was running stag and maven our art brand while i was away is now leaving and i will be the sole person running that business um before um she was taking a small wage from the business while she kind of ran the business while i was away so i'll be taking over her role and i'll be taking that wage for the next foreseeable future running that business so I will be getting a small wage from doing that and then with better not stop my plan is I've already got quite a lot of free resources on the blog I've got two books coming out how to save for an adventure and how to plan for an adventure and they'll be coming out later on this year which is another source of income which I'm looking to do are you self-publishing your books yeah I am I, I don't know if you've seen that um Tim Moss, the guy that does the Next Challenge Grant, he's just written some really good blog posts on the process of him self-publishing his book. And I've also found some really great information from the business of adventure, which is Cathy O'Dowd. Um, I think her newsletter is fantastic. I find her, everything she writes about really informative and well thought out. And a guy called Pat Flynn, who he's not in the adventure space. He's he has a blog called Smart Passive Income, and he talks about how you can earn money on the internet through affiliate sales and having your own products and your own courses. And he's got some really good information on um, how to self-publish as well. So for me, that that's the way to go. Yeah, Cathy O'Dowd's Business of Adventure is absolutely, it is the best newsletter to receive because there's, all, there's just so much information in there and it is so relevant. And then with, with Amazon Books, I mean, I probably make about you know, £30 a month from the books coming through and it, it's not big chunks of change. And I think, I, I don't know, I just, I suppose it's just about being realistic um, and that you, it's not necessarily one one thing that you'll do, which is suddenly going to going to change it. You've got to have all these all these different 
avenues. So you, you were saying with Better Not Stop, you've got these some free resources. And what other things are you using or have you used? I mean, Patreon has been incredible for me. And I think you've just started out on the platform. How, how's that going for you? Yes, yeah, well, my mum, <laughs> my mum's <laughs> giving me a cup of coffee a month. Um, to be honest, I started Patreon. And also, the thing about that platform is you need to be creating valuable content for people that gives them a reason to be sponsoring you. For me, you know, I'm a sponsor of the Tough Girl podcast. I think what you're doing is incredible. I think it's just a reality nowadays that even if you're creating loads of useful, valuable content that loads of people are using, using people still expect it for free. But people are totally expecting to kind of absorb all this free information and content and, and not pay for it. And that's just the reality of how the media is nowadays. And it's as as content creators that's something that we need to I don't think we need to kind of rally against it I think it's a really great way for our work to get to as many people as possible but it's certainly something that we need to consider that if we are going to be asking people to pay for something that we're doing we have to be offering them either even more or just an incentive to be doing that and I think part of that is just creating useful content for them because it doesn't I mean I've seen your Instagram stories you know you'll be like, oh, it's 9pm, maybe I'll edit another podcast. And I'm sitting there, you know, already in my pyjamas watching Netflix being like, oh, Sarah, stop being so hardworking. <laughs> like, this is like incredible that you're doing this, but you know, you're making it all look bad. It's like you said, I met Kathy as well. And I feel like this should be actually like, you know, the, the Kathy O'Dowd Appreciation Society, <laughs> because I loved her when I met her. And she's climbed Everest twice. I'm sat there in a back brace thinking, what am I going to have in common with this woman who's just like doing all this amazing like physical feats and actually what I found in common with her was this kind of real kind of honest no nonsense approach about kind of an adventure career which I really really loved and for me for better not stop is I really want to be as kind of transparent about my income as possible I'm going to start to do monthly income reports so people are knowing exactly how much money I'm making every month and the things I'm doing to try and make the money because I thought actually what I would be really interested in is a case study of how people are making their money in the adventure zone and not just that but also how they are what steps they're then taking to increase their income and what advice I can get from that and what I could use practically in my life so for example if they've spent this much time writing a book and then they spend this much time promoting their book how much money do they make from their book and and things like that and how much page views are they getting on their website there's a lot of adventures I absolutely love and I don't think you should have to talk about money if you don't want to talk about money but certainly for me um, there's been a lot of talk uh, within the adventure industry recently about privilege white privilege within the industry male privilege within the industry and certainly from from my personal experience I've been to events where there's a lot of people that went to private school or were able to, you know, I didn't even get on a plane till I was 15 because that's when I had enough pocket money to to afford to go on a plane. So I didn't go on overseas trips when I was a kid. I think I went on like a couple of school trips to Germany and France. But that's because we were on benefits and we kind of the school subsidised poor kids going on that trip no, that's not politically correct to say but that's that's how I got to go to Europe for the first time so we didn't have any money and you meet a lot of people and they've had a lot more opportunities perhaps than you and I think you know fair play to them like lucky them if you're lucky enough to be able to have uh, sailing lessons in your teenage years so that you can do something or climbing and all this kind of stuff that's amazing but the reality is a lot of us do not have those opportunities and but I don't think that should be a barrier for anybody to not achieve things in my opinion that was a barrier for me I thought I wasn't going to be able to ever go on a big expedition because I didn't have I didn't know anyone that could sponsor me I didn't earn enough money I didn't you know I wasn't kind of in that crowd but actually when I the more I speak to people People are nice. People are inclusive. It doesn't really matter where people's backgrounds are from. You can't hold it against somebody that they had a better education or have access to more money than you. But certainly it's nice to feel that there is a group of people that have an understanding that that's 
that we we aren't all in that lucky position but that doesn't mean that we can't do the same things as everybody else I, I think it also comes down to to almost the, the attitude I mean I haven't actually heard this for a while um, but I think maybe like a couple of years ago it was it was I felt as though the impression was quit your job go traveling and <laughs> go on adventures it's all going to be wonderful and and it's and then obviously someone who did that and and I you know I know that I'm coming from a very privileged position because I did you know I did work in banking and finance for eight years I did have savings behind me I'm very fortunate that I do have this massive safety net of my parents who are just the most amazing people in the whole wide world um and I think you know I'm so fortunate to to be in to be in in that position. I always wanted to come back as well. Um, I think it's like a mind shift change now that we're going through in terms of the content that is out there and and supporting creators because obviously there is so much free stuff out there. But if you are adding value, I think that's what it always comes back to for me is like how can I add value? How can I make the content that I produce from the podcast and, and the blog and the website and social media and everything else? How can I make it so good that everyone's like? Yeah, actually, if Sarah stopped doing this, I would really miss this, and this would take this would take out a huge chunk of of my life. And I suppose that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking about at the, at the moment. Now, very quickly, I said you're actually starting a podcast, which is super exciting. So tell everybody a little bit more about your podcast. What's what's the picture? What are you hoping to achieve with it? Um, so yeah, so my podcast also is kind of in the adventure sphere kind of based around the same stuff that my blog's around so really talking to people about who are probably not living the typical nine to five who are doing maybe something creative with their life something adventurous with their life something a bit out of the ordinary um are really going to talk in depth about topics like minimalism like creativity like adventure and kind of really delve into kind of the things that we are doing with our lives and why they've made the choices they have so it's kind of based around uh, creativity and adventure and kind of talking to people about the reasons they're living the life that they're living it's going to be fantastic and the launch date is the launch date is the 20th of july put that in your diary and then i'll be at the hopefully be at the adventure travel film festival in london a couple of weeks after banging on about it to anyone that will listen to me so <laughs> No, absolutely fantastic. To be honest, there's so many different things that we could have talked about in like in, with regards to money, even just, you know, the key ways to fund adventure. And there's so many different resources and avenues that we could have gone down. We could like 10 hours later, we could still be talking, discussing. But I think as almost like a starting place as a platform just to give people more ideas and a more sort of realistic grounding in sort of funds and raising, you know, save, well, getting out of debt and then saving funds. Um, it's been absolutely so, so useful in all the different resources you mentioned, such as the business of adventure and Pat Flynn and Tim Moss and me talking about like Gary Vaynerchuk and stuff. So Hannah, final words of advice from you with regards to, to money, whether that's how people should look at it, how they should earn it, how they should spend it, or how it shouldn't connect to your happiness. What's, what are your thoughts on money? Okay, so firstly, I think I just want to go back to just quickly back to uh, your your background because you say you come from this privileged position but you're in that position so because you, you're incredibly intelligent and you're hard working and I don't think it's very easy to get a difficult job in banking and so I feel like that's amazing that you did that I think it's incredible and it's and it's great that you've got a fantastic relationship with your parents so that you can stay at their house and I think don't take away what an incredible achievement those two things are I think what I'm I'm more coming from the place like you said there was this kind of like I quit my you know six six figure corporate job and now I travel the world I think to do that to one to be able to create a job in a in an industry which is very difficult to be in and very high stress and work hard in that and earn the money and earn the savings and then travel like fair play to you I'm like 100% got your back I think that's fantastic I guess my viewpoint is that's not something I don't I think I would ever be able to achieve I don't think I could ever I'm terrible with maths anyway so I'm always using the calculator on my phone I think it was more that some there was this period where it was like that's the only way that you're going to be able to to be an adventure you're only going to be able to be an adventure if you have worked really hard created this safety net of savings behind you and then you're able to do this huge trip of your huge trip 
I've not done that. I've done it a different way. And I think it's now just looking, I think the adventure space is now looking at people in a way where we're all coming at this from different angles and we're coming at it from different starting points. And actually there's no one way to become an adventurer, you know, back, you know, a hundred years ago, the only way you would have been an adventurer is if you were from a kind of a upper class family and you didn't really have anything to do with your time and your money. So you were going to go and do some adventures. I don't think everybody else was probably way too busy just kind of paying the bills to be thinking of that as a possible thing that we could be doing with our lives. But we're kind of in this space now where it doesn't matter where you're starting from. You've still got the ability to achieve what you want with a lot of hard work. Yes. But with preparation and planning, there is a lot that can be achieved and if we kind of like you said, if, if our money mindset has changed and what we're spending our money on and how we're spending our money, there's actually a lot that we can do from a personal point of view to kind of improve things for ourselves. I earn a lot less money than I did before I went away. I'm going to be on £600 a month for the foreseeable future, which is the only amount of money I'm able to be able to take away from my other business. And on that, I need to pay my bills, pay my rent run my business and build better not stop and I think for me I'm going to try and do it and I'm going to go full throttle and do my best and if I don't achieve everything I want to achieve that's fine for me it's definitely about kind of taking ownership of things and being realistic and not letting your current situation affect what your future one might be oh my god 100% like there's just oh so many so many (laughs) so many truth bombs that that you you've dropped in there home percent doesn't matter where you're starting from hard work preparation and planning and that change in the money mindsets and embracing minimalism as well hannah where's the best place for people to find out more information about you to read up more on your story of getting out of debt how you save funds and also the income reports that you're going to be publishing which i think will be absolutely fascinating yeah well i mean hopefully it's quite interesting that the more you talk about money the more people kind of come out the woodwork and are prepared to talk about money too so I kind of popped out on Twitter that I was going to start doing income reports and I've connected with you know maybe an extra 10 or 20 people just in a a Twitter chat this morning talking about kind of the realities of people even publishing income reports because when someone's publishing an income report and they're earning you know six figures passive income a month and you just can't even comprehend how they've got there I thought, well, this is perfect. I'll show it from point zero. So at the moment, I'm talking to you and it's my first month and we're now on the like the middle of the month and I'm still on zero for my first month. So that's kind of where it's all beginning. But if you want to read anything about me, it's just betternotstop.com. Same for all my social media handles. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we've also got a Better Not Stop group. Yeah, I'm just kind of there and ready to chat to anybody who wants to chat about money or adventure really and do you know what's really interesting I think you've made a great point is sometimes it's very easy to look at somebody someone who's been doing it for example like Pat Flynn who's probably been doing it for like 15 years or whatever and that's why he's able to earn these sums of money every single month but and Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this as well and this is actually my philosophy for social media which is document don't create so whenever you're having to think you know what what should I write about what should I put on social media what beautiful image should I portray whereas I'm just like you know what I'm documenting my journey so in like four or five years time you can look back and be like oh my god you remember when Sarah was working from her bed in her bedroom and and oh yeah and then she was she was earning like x amount from Patreon and she had like 20 patrons or 100 patrons and now she's got like a thousand patrons and she's traveling the world and doing this that people can look back and be like yeah, but she started there. So I think for you, this is going to be, and for everybody else to follow along as well, an incredibly powerful journey because this is your starting point. How many patrons have you got now? 192, which is amazing. And the- that is amazing. But just, I can imagine like you started what Tough Girl in, was it like 2015, 16? And even the concept of 200 people, the majority of whom are complete strangers, providing you an income to do something that you're completely passionate about and they found what you're doing and they feel exactly what you're feeling that that feeling is i think why we why we create the content we create we create it because we are just so passionate about talking about it and and that's i think you just attract you just attract your tribe and yes. i think that's really what you've done with tough girl and if i achieved like half of that that would be just amazing oh you're 
everybody's going to succeed. There's success, enough success to go around <laughs> for everybody. It's all about, it's, I just don't feel as though it's like competitive. Like I'm coming from a very like competitive background. I feel as though it's more nowadays like about collaboration, working together and su- just supporting one another. And I think that can just be in- incredibly powerful. So it's a, it's a journey and there's going to be high points and low points, but it's just about having that having that end goal. So Hannah, final words of wisdom, final words of advice. Oh God. Words of wisdom is pretty much anything that you think you need to pay for, you can find for free on the internet. As me and Sarah have just discussed, there's so much content and help and resources online. Best places to look are to try and find people that have the same attitude and vibe as you. If you don't have them in your hometown, they will exist on the internet. There's Facebook groups, there's online communities you can tap into and you can be part of. Find your tribe because it's the people that you surround yourself with that will bring you up, that will support you and will allow you to really achieve any of your dreams. And if the people around you now aren't doing that, change the people that are around you. 100%. Because one of my favorite quotes from the minimalists is, you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. And it's the concept that you can't change who people are, but you can change the people that you choose to have in your life. And I think that's so important. And for me, I've reached out to so many people that I've admired like Sarah and like Kathy and Bex Band and Tom Allen and tons of other adventurers. And everyone has been warm, everyone's been kind. And even just surrounding myself and talking to people that are doing things that I'm really happy about, it's pushed me into this direction. And yeah, find your tribe, reach out to people, talk to them, build build just your own personal community, and then you will literally be able to do anything that you want. Absolutely agree. You can do anything that you want. Hannah Cox, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Extra to talk about money. It's been so inspiring, so many truth bombs. So I will be putting all the information in the show notes uh, with all the links to what we've discussed so you can very easily go and find it. Hannah, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey tribe, how you doing? I hope you enjoyed that extra episode with Hannah Cox talking all about money. I have just realized when I went back to do the editing that I hadn't actually introduced myself at the start. So if you're brand new to the podcast, you're probably thinking, who's this other person talking? Uh, Well, my name is Sarah Williams. I am the host of the Tough Girl podcast and Tough Girl Extra. You can find out all about me at toughgirlchallenges.com. Now this was an extra episode. So this was an extra episode that came out on a Thursday, but generally the Tough Girl podcast comes out every Tuesday at 7am UK time. Now if you've just listened to this episode and haven't heard almost like the second part, this is like a two part episode. One, we've got the story of Hannah and getting out of £20,000 worth of debt and talking about money, which is what you've listened to now. But there's also the second part, which was released a couple of days ago, where Hannah shares more about her incredible overland expedition from the UK to Bhutan, 18,000 miles over 10 months. And she talks more about that journey and what she's learned. So it's well worth listening to both of them. All of the links that we've talked about will be in the show notes. So please do go check out toughgirlchallenges.com. Now, we obviously have talked a lot about money uh, in this podcast. And one of the biggest questions that I always get asked is, how do I afford to do what I do? And as I've made it clear from the podcast, I am, you know, I'm very, very lucky to be living with my parents at the moment, but I am 36 years old. I need to make a change and I can't continue to live with my parents. I need to start making an income because I do have bills that I need. I need to pay. The plan is for me to finish my master's, which I'm doing at the moment. I have my dissertation in, in on the 31st of August. And then in early September, I'm going to be off. I will be leaving home and hopefully traveling the world on an adventure. But I'll be filling you more in about those plans. But the reason I'm able to put the podcast out to produce the content that I do is because of my incredible patrons that we've talked about. If you want to learn more about becoming a patron and signing up, then please do go check out patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl. 
And on there, there are different levels that you can support at $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, $15 a month, obviously very dependent on your income levels at the moment and what you can afford and and, um, and also how much value you think the Tough Girl podcast and Tough Girl Extra is adding to, to your life. If you subscribe at the $5 level, you can then get access to the Tough Girl Tribe, which is the closed Facebook community. We have Facebook live events happening on a Sunday. There's inspiring posts going out. Um, there's lots of support. There's lots of encouragement and there's a huge amount of knowledge in the Tough Girl Tribe as well. So it's an incredibly supportive place to be. I spend a lot of time in that Facebook group engaging with everybody in there, um, you know, adding as much value as I possibly can. But if you do get value from the Tough Girl podcast, please do consider giving back because it's all about that cumulative effect. And some people think, oh, Sarah, but I feel, you know, I'm not embarrassed, but some people sort of message sort of saying, oh, I can only afford like two dollars a month or a dollar a month and I'm like that is absolutely fine because it's not just about one person supporting it's about all of the listeners supporting um you know all members of the tough girl tribe supporting even just one dollar a month from every listener is absolutely life-changing it does make a massive difference to know you've got this regular income that comes in on where it starts to get processed on the first of the month but it comes into my account on the third or fourth of every month and I know exactly how much I've got so it really helps me to budget and to plan where I need to spend um, spend the money on you know what resources I, I need to to buy and how to and how I can improve the Tough Girl podcast. So yeah, lots going on at the moment. Please do make sure that you are following along on social media, Instagram stories. I'm at Tough Girl Challenges. I'm on Twitter at underscore tough underscore girl. Also on Facebook and all that jazz. Please do go check out Hannah as well. Hannah's podcast is going live this week. So well worth going to have a listen. Hannah's also interviewed me for her podcast. So I'll be making sure that I share that episode as well. This is what I love, collaboration, which is totally awesome. Anyway, guys, whatever you are, whatever you are doing, just have a fantastic day. If you've got a goal, if you've got a financial goal, write it down, put it somewhere you can see it, start taking a step today to make that goal a reality. Don't just leave it as this dream, turn it into a goal and then create a plan and start taking those steps necessary. Just break it down, chunk it down and take the first step today because you will get there eventually. I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl podcast. Until then, lots of love and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.